I'm an artist. Um, I wear a lot of different hats, but I, I work under the pseudonym Scapegoat Studio, um, providing various artistic services for churches, um, including liturgical art and illustration and graphic design, and with you. Um, uh, and in, in the schedule it says that this is going to be an art presentation and it's um, not going to be so much looking at art, um, certainly not my art, but um, this is going to be a discussion of beauty. And uh, you know, probably the Lutheran in us rolled their eyes a little bit because we've been talking about um, means of grace and the sacraments and things that are that are solid and real that, and we can touch. And, you know, talking about beauty is, is kind of touchy feely. Um, and so we're actually going to address that um, because we do want to look at beauty um, in the context of the catechism, in particular, uh, the first article of the creed. And that's in, in contrast, of course, to the way that our culture looks at beauty. So as a segue into that, um, I want to ask you, uh, what are some idioms regarding beauty? What are some ways that we throw around beauty in our everyday speech? Hmm. That's kind of think it's in the eye of the beholder. Right, yeah. You read the name of the presentation. So. <laughs> uh, any other one? Any other one? Beauty is purely subjective. Skin deep. Okay, yeah, good one. Beauty is skin deep. That's one I've heard. Um, yeah, that's true. We don't hear beauty is truth. <laughs> truth beauty. Right, right. Here are some that I came up with with the help of like Google search, just to be thorough. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Related to that, one man's trash is another's treasure. It doesn't have beauty in the in the sentence, but beauty is only skin deep, age before beauty, a way to be polite and sarcastically <laughs> insult somebody at the same time. I need my beauty sleep. And here's one that came up, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. Uh, obviously, if I ask you which of these you hear the most, and which you hear not at all, you'll probably come up with you know, the same ones I do. In Beauty is in the eyes of all there. You hear that all the time. Um, I mean, even even from Christians, from Lutherans, you hear that. Um, it's one of those cases where a lie repeated off. Not everyone just believes it. Um, we don't question it. Here's this one I've never ever heard. Um, so I was kind of surprised to see a thing of beauty is a joy forever. Apparently, it's the first line of a poem from John Keats. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if the fact that we never hear this, I mean, we hear this all the time, that's a litmus test for the way uh, our culture sees beauty. So I'm going to start out um, as, a, as a prologue to show you a work of art that I think most everyone would consider beautiful. This is the Ghent Altarpiece uh, by Hubert and Jan van Eyck. And as evidence that this is uh, probably in the running for the most beautiful work of art ever created in any medium, um, this is also the most stolen work of art in, in history. Um, it was stolen seven times, and this is a massive work. It's probably like 30 feet long by 20 feet high. It's all these various wood panels. Not one you can just stick in your pocket. Um, if any of you have seen the movie The Monuments Men, uh, this painting figures in that movie. It's a group of allies that during World War II they were tasked with running around Europe trying to stop the Nazis. Well, one, one mission was to recover artwork that was stolen by the Nazis, and, and the Nazis also had this, this kill order that uh, if Hitler ever fell, if the Third Reich ever fell, they had these vast warehouses of, of just filled with Western culture and their orders were to burn it. So if the 
Third Reich couldn't have it, no one could. And so thankfully this, this painting survived World War II um, and many other times it was stolen. In every respect, I think, in terms of and just the subject matter here is Christ, he is the Virgin on the side, St. John on this side, uh, Adam and Eve, um, Cain and Abel is told, told on the very top here. Um, on the bottom you have, in heaven, the adoration of the Lamb at the center here. So many theological points that come together. So in theology, in, in physical beauty, in craftsmanship and symbolism, um, I think this painting is absolutely peerless in the world of art. Now, I think that you could probably go without saying that uh, many of its contemporary peers are not actually trying uh, for beauty. Uh, Ooh. Is, uh, <laughs> Mark Rothko, number six, violet, green, and red. Um, this is actually, right as of right now, it is the fifth most expensive painting in the world, sold for $186 million. When I gave this, when I gave this presentation a year ago to a Wittenberg Academy group, mostly of 10-year-olds, this was uh, the third most expensive painting. So in the last year, two others have bumped it down. Um, and I wish you could say that two better paintings bumped it down, but um, that's not the case. Um, so that's Mark Rothko. Jackson Pollock is a little better known. This is number five, 1948. Uh, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, Pollock was a household name. Everyone was talking about Pollock. Um, this particular work isn't known as his best work, but let's be frank, his best work wasn't that much better than his worst. <laughs> this painting rounds out the top 10 most expensive paintings ever sold. Um, so things like that make the serious artist <coughs> ask uh, existential questions, like, why do I even try? <laughs> <laughs> so today's presentation is going to be called Beauty in the Beheld, a Lutheran Perspective on Beauty and Art. And the uh, presentation is going to be broken into five parts. Uh, first, beauty is not in the eyes of the beholder. God is the source of all beauty. Beauty is corrupted. Beauty isn't always obvious. And humanity needs objective beauty. So thesis one, beauty is not in the eyes of the beholder. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about postmodernism, it's kind of a slippery fish. When, you know, it's hard to grab onto. You can ask 12 different people and get 12 different answers for uh, what is postmodernism. Um, but one of the central tenets and the, the thing that most people tend to agree on is uh, the central concept of, of relativism. How, uh, you know, what's uh, the, the idea that truth if something is true for you, it may not be true for me, and so on and so forth. And that was kind of the result of, of modernizing what happened in the 20th century when uh, philosophers, and, and it kind of went hand in hand with, with the, the, the rise in academia of, of evolution. About the beginning of 1900, you know, we started to question our, our status as created beings. So I, I think probably that that could be pointed to as as one of the the central problems here. Um, so um, the the result of questioning our status as created human beings um, resulted in also questioning uh, the other transcendental. So, I mean, besides truth, besides questioning what is truth. Uh, question the other transcendent. What, what is you know, what is goodness? What is what is beauty? So beauty kind of went out with the bathwater too. Uh, how can beauty be objective 
but no two people can agree on what is beautiful. This is postmodern thought. How can beauty be objective when no one can define it? And how can beauty be objective when it is clearly determined by race and culture? Um, I'll just pause here and, and explain what we mean by subjective and objective. Um, I don't want to be talking over people's heads, so forgive me if it sounds like I'm talking down to you a little bit. Um, it's more of a, a grammatical term, but like when we're talking about art, um, you are always the subject. The art is always the object. So when we're talking about beauty and whether it's subjective or objective, it's the question of, does beauty exist in my head or in my senses? Is it just something that, that my brain is telling me? Or does beauty actually exist? in either the work of art or in creation and whatever it is that we're looking at. <coughs> so this is Dana Joya. Um, he's a, a Catholic poet, but he's, uh, he has some just brilliant talks about beauty. Um, and you can, this, The Great Divorce, Catholicism and the Arts, uh, you can find this on YouTube, where I pulled this quote from. Uh, in case you're looking for it. Um, he says, beauty is a purely social construction in the eyes of the postmodern thinker. Beauty is an illusion in the eye of the beholder, a series of signs fabricated to create the impression of meaning, conditioned by social conventions, shaped by class, religion, class, race, nation, gender, and ideology. Excuse me. A gesture by one group to raise its status and authority over another group. Beauty is all surface. Its deeper meaning is a social construction. Postmodern thinkers even have a wonderful term for beauty. It is a pleasure technology. It is neither true nor universal. It is a sort of consumer product, something made rather than discovered. And he sarcastically adds, thank you, postmodernism. <laughs> so this is not, it's obviously not a, a postmodern manifesto. This is kind of what the, the critics of postmodernism have, have observed. <clears throat> so the results of this kind of thinking are that in, in a culture that rejects theism, Beauty has no source, no meaning, and no benefit. And we can see this clearly in the art that has been uh, the most critically acclaimed in the past 60 or 70 years especially. Art is divorced from beauty on a principle because beauty was no longer seen as a valid end to a pursuit. And value is unrelated to beauty or craftsmanship. As a result, art has become little more than a commodity. Um, this, the video is not going to work because I had to use a PDF, but there was this nice little clip that I pulled from Iron Man where uh, uh, <laughs> it's just this funny little scene where uh, uh, Tony Stark, who is Iron Man, uh, his assistant comes to him and says, do you still want this Jackson Pollock painting, blah, 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 blah. And he First of all, he pretends to be enlightened by asking some questions, and really he just uh, shows his ignorance about art. And he asks her what she thinks of it. She says, I think it's incredibly overpriced. He says, I need it. Buy it, store it. So it's just a funny little criticism of, of, of what we've done with art. It's not, of course, nobody wants to look at a Jackson Pollock. You, the, uh, you just buy this because. It's, um, it's like a status symbol. It shows you how intellectual you are. That you own, so he just buys it and stores it. Doesn't matter how much it costs. In fact, the more the better, right? So, um, the very idea of uh, beauty in the eye of the beholder resulted in a total collapse of artistic standards. And the most notable of which was beauty. Um, in fact, much art lacking any theological foundation now went in the opposite direction. Um, so they're seeking intentionally now to be ugly, to be irreverent, to be offensive, because the more distance it can put between 
between you, the ordinary average art viewer, and themselves, the better. It's all about class warfare now. Um, so if beauty is the invention of man, it can be discarded or reinvented at will. And uh, we can brainwash ourselves into thinking that Pollock and Rothko were good painters. But I think deep down, uh, we all really know that, that beauty is a real thing. Uh, that it, it can't really be in the eye of the beholder. We'll talk about why. I think, so if instinctively we know all this, um, why am I giving this presentation? Um, because I think, like I said before, even as Lutherans, we still hear this so much. It's repeated so much, often from our own mouths. We even, well, you know, you like what you like, I like what I like. And there's no real discussion about, you know, what, what beauty is. And I think there's a cognitive dissonance that happens when we say that, essentially say that beauty doesn't really exist, but we also believe that, you know, I believe in God the Father, Almighty Maker of Heaven and Earth. I don't think those, I think those two are mutually exclusive. So thesis number two, God is the source of all beauty. Um, beauty that cannot be in the eye of the It's not only obvious in nature, but it's, it's obvious in theology. So we hear in Genesis 1.31, And God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. It's the evening and the morning on the sixth day. Um, and then the Psalms talk about creation, uh, the wonders of creation so often, but um, here's a good one, just as a representative. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hand. Um, so, some people will ask, well, how do you get beauty out of this, necessarily? Well, I can see that argument, but to say something is very good, uh, we can tell from this verse, it's, it's not just good in the sense that it was functional. You know, like a stapler is functional. Oh, yeah, it's, it's good. Uh, you know, this was creation. It was very good. It was perfect. It was orderly. Everything was exactly the way God wanted it. And something that is ugly, uh, or that, that isn't beautiful, we could never say of it that it was not. Or we could never say of it that it was very good. Um, so I think there's, there's not really a leap in logic there. Um, so, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hand. Um, in other words, beauty is, is God's signature on creation. We go on. Um, Luther's explanation of the first article. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven. What does this mean? I believe that God made me he gave me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, and mind, and all my abilities. <coughs> um, and I, I really want to focus on, you know, all my abilities part, because <coughs> if God made beauty his signature on creation, uh, your signature is meant to be a sign. I did this. And the signature is no good unless you can read it. So, so God instilled in us our abilities, including the ability to see and, and to recognize beauty in nature. That's built into us. We, uh, we, so we, I argue that we're aesthetic creatures. We're, we're created to recognize and also to take pleasure in God's creation. St. Augustine. Those beautiful patterns which through the medium of men's souls are conveyed into their artistic hands emanate from that beauty which is above our souls, which my soul sighed after day and night. Man, that is such a beautiful sentence. I mean, we don't write like that anymore. Uh, beautiful patterns which through the medium of men's souls are conveyed into their artistic hands emanate from that beauty which is above our souls, which my soul sighed after day and night. 
So um, Augustine is saying, you know, even when artists create something that's beautiful, he's saying that beauty isn't coming from the artist. It's really coming from the creator who made the art and who put in us our abilities. So the artist is kind of a conduit, uh, a medium through which God projects his beauty onto creation, and in a way in which he continues his act of creation. Love that quote. So if God is the source of all beauty in the created universe, and if we are also imbued with the ability to recognize it, what is to be our response? Uh, well, of course, as with all things, upon recognizing his beauty, God wants us to glorify him. Um, so we're going to look at a, a scriptural example. So we're in Genesis again. And the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Now I'm sure the poetry is lost here in the English, but they still keep that poetic structure. Uh, it's, I mean, arguably this is Adam breaking out into song when he sees this beautiful help meet that God brought to him. Um, so he, re <laughs> he recognizes her beauty, uh, immediately praises God for that. I mean, who knew that uh, Genesis had the makings of a musical? <laughs> oh, what a beautiful woman! <laughs> <laughs> So he, so he glorifies God for, for his wife. Give unto the Lord the glory, do his name, worship the Lord, in the beauty of holiness. So again, the Psalms are, are full of, of talking about the, the creation of God, the beauty and wonders of God, and ascribing to him glory. I like this passage, though, because it connects Beauty and holiness again. So we, there we have that beauty and goodness. Those are those two um, transcendentals. By the way, I skipped over that part. Um, truth and beauty and goodness, the three transcendentals. Those are, uh, that's kind of Aristotelian thinking, that those are the, the three, um, how, do you, how do you refer to them? The three qualities of, of reality. Um, and we still use that, those in as a model in classical education. Um, so here we have again beauty and holiness or goodness kind of connected, connected together. But I also like this because it connects beauty and holiness back into worship. Um, so we're, we're worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness. <coughs> Find my place again. So he implies then that, that beauty is a natural part of our worship. And that isn't just a conclusion we can get from like pulling one single verse out of, out of the Psalms and, and taking it out of context, but all throughout Scripture. Um, you think of especially the tabernacle and Solomon's temple, um, the splendor and the beauty that that God specifically commanded is, and all of this, he showed them patterns. This is, this is how you worship me. The beauty of holiness. I think that's, there's that connection. Uh, hopefully you've noticed the, the kind of artistic scheme that I designed for these slides. And is you have down here the, the cherubim, uh, you know, woven in blue and scarlet and purple linen. This is, this is what is described as the veil of the tabernacle. Um, so this, again, this beauty imbuing our worship with beauty. Um, so, that beauty is, is really a gift of God. It's creation. It's meant for our, our, our pleasure and our enjoyment, obviously, but it's not just to be admired. 
it's, it's a gift then to be used and multiplied like every other gift that God gives us. Um, if, you're, so if you're at all like me, you, you read through the Bible, um, it's, it's really, really easy to skip over Exodus. You know, it's, um, Genesis is so wonderful and full of all these narratives that we all know and love. And then we get to Exodus and it's just chapter after chapter of all these commands and regulations and then the Israelites screw up and God gives them to them again, almost verbatim. And so we tend to kind of gloss over this even if we do read it. And so for many years, I missed this passage of scripture that, I mean, it's not only meant for all of us, but uh, I felt like it was really meant for me in a, in a special way. See, the Lord is called Bezalel, the son of Uri. He has filled him with the spirit of God wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, and all manner of workmanship to design artistic works. And he's put in his heart the ability to teach. I don't know if you know this, but Bezalel is actually the first person in the Bible who is ever mentioned as having, uh, in, this, uh, in this special way, is having the Spirit of God. It's not, it's not Abraham, it's not... Um, Isaac or Jacob, it's not Moses, it's, it's Bezalel. Who, who's Bezalel? He was just this you know, dirty Hebrew slave that you know came out of Egypt and they were wandering across the desert. So, I mean, think about, I mean, obviously I'm an artist, so maybe this strikes you differently than it strikes me, but uh, so many artists work hard their whole lives hoping to get you know, like one big commission, you know, maybe one phone call from the Pope, or you know, sell a <laughs> sell one painting for six figures or something. Bezalel gets a commission from the Almighty God. Let me just let that sink in. Um, the Maker of heaven and earth uh, asked Bezalel to make you know, the Ark of the Covenant and and to weave the tapestries, and to make the seven-armed seven -armed candlestick. God is fully capable of making these things himself. Uh, he, he created heavens and earth. Obviously, he could handle a few little candlesticks and things, but, but he asked us to do it. So that's where this uh, the stewardship of beauty ties in. Um, and we'll talk about this again later, but so God takes pleasure not only in, in his own works, but in our works as well. But, I mean, he created us to do this. Not every single person, but you know, humanity as, as a whole. So thesis three, beauty is corrupted. Now, so far the, the firm believer in and the eye of the beholder would say, you know, well, okay, that's a nice story and everything, but um, if beauty is really an objective reality, then why can't anybody agree on what it is? And this is the answer. Again, we're in Genesis. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband, and he ate. So the irony here is that, that beauty was undone because you know, of, this, of this food that was pleasant to the eye. Beauty was undone by beauty. Not, not entirely, of course, there are other things going on here. Um, so, so Eve sees this, this beautiful fruit, this work of God's creation that God made to be attractive. Um, so instead of giving glory to God, she covets that for herself. She takes, she eats. Adam takes it, he eats. And, and from that point on, uh, all the beauty and the order and the perfection of creation is, is not utterly destroyed, thanks be to God. But um, it, it is tarnished. Is certainly tarnished. <clears throat> Here's another example. 
2 Samuel, Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. I, I think the parallel from, from this passage to the presentation of Eve to Adam is, is worth noting here. You know, both passages, we have a man and a beautiful naked woman. Uh, but that's about where the, the similarities stop, right? Uh, we know what happened. David coveted Bathsheba. He committed adultery. Uh, eventually, he committed murder. Um, so he sees and recognizes beauty. He still has that ability from God. Um, obviously, Bathsheba is still beautiful. She still has that gift from God. Uh, but David doesn't give God glory. He covets and, and he takes something that isn't his. So, uh, where we get from this is that even God's good gift of beauty can be turned inward. That's, there's that cravat says again, and corrupted into sin. Sin mars both the beauty or the order of God's creation. Um, and our ability to recognize it. And even when we do recognize the beauty of creation, sin makes us unwilling to glorify God. So this explains why so much beauty is self-serving, uh, or I should say beauty in art that is, so much of it is self-serving. Um, it glorifies our lusts and our passions. Uh, it explains why we disagree about what is beautiful and what isn't. And it explains much of the ugliness that passes for great art in our culture. The subjectivity in art comes from our, our striving to grasp and recognize and uh, apply that beauty, and sometimes even our total rejection of it. Um, so just to clarify, um, I'm not saying that beauty is not in any way subjective. I'm saying the subjectivity is not about whether or not beauty exists. The subjectivity comes from the fact that, that our minds and our abilities are corrupted by sin. Beauty is tarnished by sin. And so even though beauty exists objectively, we, we have to believe it exists objectively, we can still disagree about what is beautiful and what isn't. So there is still some subjectivity. Thesis four, beauty isn't always obvious. So we've already said that in our fallen state, we don't always recognize beauty, but I want to, to develop that further. That's not what I mean by saying beauty isn't always obvious. Um, remember, how, again, how truth, beauty, and goodness are related. The wonderful thing about beauty, I think, is that it isn't skin deep. Um, when, when there's that truth, beauty, goodness connection, um, I think the beauty goes a lot deeper to the point where it may not always be obvious. It may not always be attractive, in other words. Um, so, for example, Oops, I got ahead of myself. Um, okay. The wonderful thing about beauty is it isn't only skin deep. To, to call beauty a sensory experience uh, is to cheapen it. Beauty affects us holistically. In other words, standing at the edge of uh, the Grand Canyon, it's, it's not just a sensory experience. Standing in the nave of Chartres uh, Cathedral is not just a sensory experience. Uh, it, it stirs emotions, it sparks our intellect, and uh, I believe you could argue it actually touches our soul. <coughs> and not just, not just in the sense that um, religious symbols communicate things. I mean, that, that's obvious too, that the didactic nature of uh, beauty in our churches obviously is there. That, I mean, like a stained glass window can be full of, of symbols and narratives that 
intellectually they remind us of God's word and, and of course God's word is effective and, and that touches our hearts but I think um, beauty kind of like what, uh, what Augustine was saying that um, you know, regardless of the content something that is really truly exquisitely beautiful um, helps us to long for heaven I think to long for the source of that beauty So when we talk about something that happens um, just on the surface, or worse yet, a, a subjective reaction to the surface, then we put on our blinders. We miss a wealth of beauty that may not be on the surface, or in other words, attractive. Um, so something may not be, something may be beautiful that does not please the sense, senses. For example, um, Jesus. Um, Isaiah 53 2 says he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him nothing in his appearance that we should desire him and yet we sing in the well beloved him beautiful savior and we're not talking about Jesus appearance so I think that's where we're getting into uh, a deeper meaning uh, for beauty. I think God actually wants us to dig into that a little bit. So the Eisenheim Altarpiece by Matthias Grunwald uh, is a terrific example of this kind of, of beauty in, in our work. And at first glance, it's, it's horrific. It's jarring. Uh, it's not something you would want to hang in front of your church. Um, Jesus, you know, his bones are all, look like they're out of joint, and his arms and hands are all distorted, and his mouth is kind of a gape. And aside from that, you know, his, his body is all gray and disgusting, and he's covered with these sores and lesions. You know, how could anyone ever say this was beautiful? Well, this painting um, is in France. It was actually... Um, painted for a monastery where they used to care for for patients of plague and especially there were certain um, skin diseases that uh, they dealt with a lot so in this painting this is not just I mean you could argue that it's, it's not attractive obviously it, you might say it's ugly but there's you know when you're a patient suffering from the plague or from this wasting uh, skin disease, lesions all over your body. And you look up at this painting, uh, the words of St. Peter and Isaiah would come together. 1 Peter 2.24 He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. And then he, Peter quotes Isaiah, by whose stripes you were healed. It also brings to Brian um, Isaiah, again, you know, he was the one who bore our infirmities, carried our sorrows. I mean, how compelling do you think it would be to see Jesus burying your diseases in his body, not just your sins? Um, you know, just when the powerful truth of that sets in, um, I think you can start to see this as a truly beautiful work of art. So if something can be beautiful that is not attractive, conversely something may please the senses and not be beautiful. For example, pornography. So that's why it's, it's so dangerous for us to say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, or that beauty is only skin deep. Um, it's not nuanced enough to, to account for, A, the Christian faith, uh, you know, B, things that are um, arguably, you know, that please the senses, you might call it attractive, but it's, uh, you know, in a Christian and theological and moral sense, it's disgusting and revolting. Any questions so far? Thesis number five, 
humanity needs objective beauty. Uh, so Dana Joya says about beauty, again, beauty is a true and powerful thing, or true and powerful way of looking into the nature of reality. There's that true beauty connection again. And as we've seen, beauty is a sign of the creator. So to, to discredit beauty as an objective reality would ultimately mean a denial of the first article of the creed. Um, truly subjective beauty could only exist in a meaningless and uncreated universe. So Christians need to see beauty for what it truly is, discard notions of subjective reality. We need to study it in all its forms and teach ourselves to recognize it. That is what is meant by developing good taste. Uh, Dr. Gina Beef talks about this a lot. He had a uh, beauty conference last year for CCLE. Uh, developing good taste, which means learning to like things that are beautiful. So a lot of times when we talk about, I mean, even in worship a lot, we talk about you know and music and, and things that I like, and, and we can get into this, you know, I like, I like, and we equate what I like with what is good or what is beautiful. Um, you know, you can't say I like Justin Bieber and therefore, you know, and I like J.S. Bach and they're both good. You know, they're, they're not on the same plane. Same. You like Justin Bieber probably because you don't have good taste. <laughs> you haven't listened to, you haven't listened to enough Bach and Handel and books to do it to know what good music is. That's what's, that's, that's what's meant by developing good taste. So part of being able to recognize beauty in God's creation, beauty in art, uh, and to be able to give God glory for these things really means we have to first learn to like it. Um, that's part of our part of our fallen world. So to, so, so to clarify what you're saying, I mean, like, I, I hate I hate picking on Justin Bieber. All the time. <laughs> I mean, like him, right? Okay, that's that doesn't make him good, but I like him, mm -hmm. right? I like listening to him. I like his music. It's, you really? it, no. But uh, <laughs> but it, it, it got a beat. It keeps me occupied. I, I can like him, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's beautiful and good. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to clarify here, right? And just because you may not like Bach or Buxtehude or, or mm -hmm. Mozart or Handel or whatever, doesn't necessarily mean that it's not good. You just don't like them. Right. You know, you, 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 we, but we have to admit one is beautiful and one is not. Yeah, and that's where, that's where it, we, I mean, we can't even have discussions uh, about what is beautiful unless we first admit that beauty is real. Beauty exists, it's not in the eye of the beholder. And if people aren't going to admit that, we can't even discuss what is good and what isn't. Just, we're, not on, we're not talking to I mean, we're talking past each other. Yeah, Scott. Would it be fair to say that beauty is something that stands the test of time? And do we know anything about what would have been considered maybe non-mainstream or cutting edge contemporary art during the Renaissance, for example, that has survived but yet is universally rejected as being garbage? Um, there's a lot of work that has survived that isn't a masterpiece. I mean, yeah, we could say that. There's, um, you yeah, know, there's a lot of mediocre art, and that's okay. I mean, it, everything doesn't have to be uh, Rembrandt um, in order for us to look at it and appreciate it, keep it in our homes. You know, this isn't to say that beauty can't be sentimental sometimes. I mean, um, the point of this, the point of this lecture is not to say, you know, go to your home and if, if anything is not as beautiful as this altarpiece, throw it out your back window. So, yeah. <laughs> Can I, perhaps, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the, um, 
the first piece. I don't remember the artist's name, the, the violet red. And he even, has a bad, he even has a bad name. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> my two, two and a half year old son could draw that. Right? I mean, yeah. And I would hang it on my fridge and I would think it's a beautiful picture mm -hmm. because of the, the sentimental value behind it. But the truth is that a two and a half year old did not draw that. Um, right? Um, is there something to be said there where what is beautiful <coughs> certainly has to do with the creator of what is beautiful? Um, you understand where I'm coming from there? I, I hear my son so. banging on the piano because I would love for him to, mm -hmm. to, be a, to be a pianist, but he is not playing anything that is beautiful to the ears. Yeah. But it is one of the most beautiful sounds that I can hear of him screaming in the house right. playing on the piano. I think this gets into a little bit of the subjectivity because you know, beauty evokes, uh, like I said, beauty plays on our intellect, it plays on our emotions, uh, our soul maybe even. Um, and we can get those connections with something that isn't beautiful because you know, you're your your father's, you're your son's father, mm -hmm. uh, and he did something beautiful for you. I think there's maybe a theological point to be made there too, because uh, somehow or another God appreciates the things that we give to him. And you know, mm -hmm. like with Bezalel, he you know, God could do much better than we can. Uh, somehow God appreciates our, our meager attempts to, to, to strive for something beautiful. Because um, God knows our hearts. You know your son's heart. At well, least to, the, uh, to a certain extent. You know? But it does, perhaps drawing that theological point a little bit further, I won't even go so far as the heart necessarily as much as the, if you, instead of calling him God, which he is, but going to that relationship of, of the address of the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. He's our father. We call him Abba, right? Um, and we're, we are his dear children. Um, this is that, that I, my father sees me and my banging on a piano, right? My my prayers or, or my <laughs> praise that I sing, or right, and it sounds like Judah banging on a piano in the middle of our dining room, right? And, um, it's not it's not inherently beautiful, but he he finds it beautiful because we are his child, um, right. not because of my heart, but because I am his child. And it's really the father's love that makes it. Yeah, beautiful. it has nothing. It has nothing to do with Judah or the music, but it's the... It's the father's. So that's it's true. a good picture of that. Yeah. Because it's, you know, when I see something, I'm, I'm thinking right now of a little, hesitating to describe it, but a little uh, partially torn up toilet paper roll with finger paint on it back home. That, uh, that, you know, it, it's, it's really ugly, frankly, but <laughs> I love it because of my love for Correct. my son. It doesn't really, it doesn't even have to do with his love for me. Yeah. You know, I like mm -hmm. he loves me, but it's doesn't have to do with that. It's about my love for him. And that's what makes God, if his love for us is what, and his gift of faith to us is what makes us able to present to him our meager offerings, as someone said, and him to receive them in love as you know, something more than they really are. Yeah, that's a good point, and thank you for making that. I, you corrected my inadvertent heresy. It was not, it was not heresy. <laughs> No, but I, th I think you certainly have drawn something out that I would not have ever thought of. Wow. Okay. First, I want to um, let Joe know that you should probably sell that to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and um, your son would pay for the rest of your life. Um, but you know, if you think about what is what is what makes this art beautiful, what makes the music of Bach beautiful, and you know, Bach's music doesn't uh, it doesn't address specific theological concerns like a Luther hymn would, right? You don't listen to box music and hear words that tell you something from scripture. Well, um, I'll well, well I'll I'll actually, you do. <laughs> well, no, but I, mean, I, I understand, I understand oh, what you're saying, you're saying. and I think I would get that reaction, but, but ultimately box music is evocative of the concepts of scripture. And, and if you appreciate it from that perspective, you will find it beautiful because you will hear it and you will, you will say, oh, I've heard this prelude used in this particular worship service during this time of the year. I understand what it means. I know the background behind it, right? This is where I'm heading with Because I do agree with you, with both of you on this. But ultimately, it comes down to sometimes in order to get the beauty, you have to understand 
the intent of the artist, but there are other situations where the beauty is inherently evident and you don't have to understand anything about the artist. Um, and then and some things you showed us, I don't know, if the artist told me what he was thinking, I'm not sure I would think it was beautiful anyway. Um, and I wonder if that plays into it. It's really, uh, does beauty require a willingness to appreciate? Like my wife says I'm handsome, but I'm pretty sure that's only because she's willing to appreciate me. So as an example. Um, I would say yes, because, well, I don't know how many questions you asked me, but um, <laughs> the, the point, to the point though that you have to be able to appreciate beauty, on some, uh, to, to be able to appreciate Bach fully, I mean, anybody can listen to Bach and tell that, I mean, it's beautiful, it's, you know, it's, but it's, it's also so mathematical and intellectual. When you study uh, St. Matthew's Passion, for instance, and learn about all the symbolism that he packed into that, that you would never, you would never pick it out if you were just listening. You have to be looking at a right. score. You have to know your, your music. You have to read music. And you know, you can see how Bach spelled out his name in the, in the notes, you know, when they're crucifying Jesus. Or, um, you know, to be able to notice the pattern where, uh, know, the strings, th there's this halo of strings that surround Jesus' words whenever he speaks, except when he's on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You wouldn't, the average listener wouldn't be able to pick those things out and appreciate them. It's only people that really, really study Bach and can appreciate it intellectually and, you know, besides just musically uh, and, and, of course, spiritually. It's just... Beauty, the beauty of box music works on so many levels, and that's why I think it's, you know, astute to realize that beauty is a holistic experience, not just aesthetic. And you, you brought up the same Matthew's Passion, which, which I should have specifically excluded from my statement because that does have words in it. And obviously, there, if, if, if you if you are listening to the words, you will hopefully see some of the symbols. And because the way that music works, the way that art works, those things help us appreciate uh, what we're listening to. Okay. Good discussion. And, and thank you all for your points. Um, so we're getting to the end here a little bit, but um, beauty was created for a purpose. Uh, besides being God's signature on his work, it was created for our enjoyment. Um, Dr. Beeth states, God exalts not only in his own creation, but also in the creation and aesthetic satisfaction of his children. So that touches on a couple of points that we were just talking about. And God somehow exalts in, in our creation. Uh, he finds satisfaction in that. And also, in our being, aesthetically satisfied by beauty. Uh, so he wants us to, to surround ourselves with beauty. That's what he made it for. Uh, you know, we're, we're aesthetic creatures. And this, this is exactly why, you know, this is one of the hugest failures of modernism. Um, they were so focused on, um, on function form and function, and, you know, a function being a, a taking precedence over form, to the point where they build all these, these huge modern, uh, you know, living complexes that were basically just cubes, I mean, and they were award winning and everything, but, but now they're, they're derelict. No one will, you can't force someone to live in those. These, these ugly buildings that, um, because they didn't realize that we're, we're aesthetic beings. We're not just gerbils that you can shove into, into boxes and expect us to be happy. You know, our, this, we're so much more than just you know, functioning creatures. Um, so a subjective view of beauty finally prohibits us from, from truly enjoying art as, as God created it. Um, 
Let's return to that quotation from Keats. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. Uh, and think about how, how appropriate that is in a Lutheran context. Think about you know, how you would depict eternal joy. How would that manifest itself in works of art? Think of the opportunity we have to make not only our, our homes, uh, but also our chapels and our churches an, an oasis of beauty apart from the desert of modern culture that, that rejects that idea entirely. Um, how natural would it be for the beauty of our worship spaces to reflect the, the truth, the goodness, the beauty, and the gospel? With King David, we also want to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So there's one final point uh, I guess I want to make before uh, we get to the conclusion of this. And that's how kind of bizarre it is to have to be in the position of arguing for for the use of something that the, the church has always had. Um, to, try and, to try and pick up this, this torch that unfortunately uh, in the last couple of, of generations we, we dropped. Uh, we've, we've just forgotten about it. Uh, so in that, in, those, those, in that short period of time, a couple of generations, uh, we've gotten so used to a lack of beauty um, that Many Lutherans aren't even sure they want it back. And you can't, you can't make somebody want something. Um, so that's that's kind of our difficulty. And after 500 years of passing on uh, a Lutheran artistic tradition, we fumbled it. So we have to teach it again. If beauty, especially in worship, says something about God, then so does a lack of beauty. By the way, this isn't. Obviously, it's not a Lutheran church. Basilica of Notre Dame in, in Montreal. Uh, it's one that I've been to. Um, just gorgeous. This um, carved altar piece. Um, and of course, at the center, you see um, Christ crucified. And so it's my contention that, that this kind of beauty um, is unique to Christianity. No other. No other religion, no other faith could, could have produced this. They, I mean, they have their own kinds of beauty, but what I really want to get to is, you know, of course, of course, I think we need to seek after beauty in a general sense and, and re-inject beauty into uh, into our worship. But um, you know, we have to go beyond the first article here. To, to really bring this to a conclusion, yes, you know, God is the source of beauty, but, but what God? You know, there are Hindu temples that are arguably beautiful. Um, God, you study, you study Muslim architecture. You, I mean, we think of Muslims as barbarians, and, and they are, but um, there are some mosques that would just knock you flat on your back. They're so beautiful. Um, very different kind of beauty than you'll find in a Christian church. But so we have to go to the second article now. Um, what God is the source of beauty? St. Paul writes, He, that is Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. All things are created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in him are all things consist. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him are the things on earth, are things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So this is, um, I think, where it comes to a head. Um, it's, it's first in the incarnation. Um, of the invisible God, and, and second in the atonement. 
Um, God made himself into an image. Uh, he made himself flesh and blood. Um, so he made himself physically present among us. That's different than any other religion. Uh, Muslims don't have it. Hindus, Buddhists, um, Jews. Um, nobody has the flesh and blood of Christ physically present among us. Uh, in the sacrament and also in, in the person of the man Jesus. Um, so the, the miracle of beauty is that God reveals to us the invisible by means of the visible. And then being the creator of all things, he reconciled to himself all things through his death on the cross. All things, even science, even mathematics, even literature, even music, even art. So what does um, what does redeemed beauty look like? God doesn't tell us. I think in part because he wants us to find out for ourselves. Um, in our fallen world, we strive to figure that out. I think part of this has to do with, with reuniting um, goodness and truth and beauty. And of course, we can find the goodness and that truth in, in his word, in his sacraments. Um, so reuniting goodness and truth and beauty, this is kind of my humble attempt to do, to do that. Um, like I said, while our interest is, is beauty, um, I think it really comes to its fullest incarnation in, in Christ on the cross, in, in the atonement. Um, in the incarnation. Um, so it, it, it all comes together again in the cross. Um, we need <coughs> beauty, I think. We need beauty because we need Christ. They're connected. Um, so encourage the study of beauty in your own homes and congregations. Uh, we'll go back to that. Develop good taste. Study J.S. Bach. Study Van Eyck, study Rembrandt, um, develop good taste. Um, especially encourage Christian artists to find new ways to make the story of salvation visible. In short, and I think with the help of the Holy Spirit, pick up the torch that the church has given us, uh, that Christ has given us, and pass it on to the next generation.
I've talked to a lot of pastors that when they have a crucifix, for instance, in the, in the chancel somewhere, uh, especially young kids, that, that impacts them immediately. They come in and they, if they don't ask about it the first thing, then they're not paying attention. And I, they're, that's really abnormal. But um, so who's that man on the cross? Who's that man? And you know, especially if they aren't church, that's the first thing they're going to ask about. And what is that? That's someone just asked you to share the gospel with them. You know, how how many other opportunities do you get like that? Um, there's an artist named Ed Riojas who, who uh, Missouri Synod, also very very good Lutheran artist, um, uh, and he participates in this big art prize event in Michigan that they do every year. Just thousands of artists descend on uh, Michigan, set up their art all through the city, and so you have all kinds of people going through. And he had, um, it wasn't even a, a, a crucifix, it was a nativity, and he had all this, this symbolism worked in. The ram whose horns were caught in a thorn bush, and um, the infant Jesus even was was wrapped like he would be wrapped for a funeral. And he had this, this Muslim guy come up to him and, and ask, who is that man and why did he have to die? Without anyone even explaining to him the, you know, the, you know, all the foreshadowing and the symbolism. And uh, so here's this artist who, you know, again, complete heathen just comes up to him and asks him to share the gospel. Um, you're gonna get you're gonna get a lot of resistance on cost usually. I mean what, you know what uh, what ladies guild hasn't said well or you know what old church member hasn't said we can't afford that when we there's still people that need saving. Um, heard that myself quite often recently. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, like a dozen snarky combat, you know, comebacks come to my mind. And, and even, even, you know, when you make good arguments, like talking about um, how much the children of Israel gave to, to build the tabernacle, you know, just, they, they gave so much that, that Aaron had to tell them to stop giving. We have more than enough. And at the same time, they didn't stop caring for the poor and for the alien like they were supposed to. It wasn't mutually exclusive. But, well, we either build our church or we share the gospel. It's not an either or, either or proposition. Um, so, I, like I said, anecdotally, uh, there's so many stories I've heard of the art, like really just stopping people in their tracks making them ask questions and, and think about things where, you know, a bare church with a, with a plain, empty cross, they, they wouldn't have done that. So, I hope it's helpful. I'm going to ask the yeah. unrelated follow-up to what someone else if you're If you're looking at it, you walk into a church, or maybe it's, it's, it's like your own, and it's really not that pretty. Um, in, in like objectively, you know, it's like got carpet on the floor and on the ceiling, and um, not literally, but you know, it's <laughs> not. It's and very bare white walls, but otherwise, you know, there's some. It, it, it looks like some a nice living room, um, and and then someone who stands beside you, it's the first time, and then like, wow, this is really this is really beautiful. But, but, you, but you know that it's not. I'm, I'm curious of what your first response would be. How would you, I mean, maybe you don't respond to it. Maybe you don't, you just say, I, you just nod and smile. Yeah, but I, I would have a. I would be tempted to nod and smile. Because I, just because I know, I mean, I don't want to say anything bad about my own church. But, you know, I, I know that it's, first of all, it's not ugly by any means. It, there's, it's, it's pretty. It's very, very plain, and there's, there's no images of Jesus, but it's pretty. You know, it's, 
um, has a very kind of <coughs> sparse, but you know, it's aesthetically pleasing. Um, and they, they love their church. And at my suggestion of a slightest change, they just, you know, it, it, they just shut down. And so I, I think um, if something does happen, it's going to be a long-term, um, very long-term teaching process. Um, so it, you know, it's not like there's a there's a good argument that you can make in, in one minute and that oh, I see your point. And, um, so I think I just I would really what I'd like to see is just people. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know whether it starts from the, the bottom up or the top down or, or some other way, but um, I'd love to see people talking about beauty um, in all the in all of its forms, uh, especially in worship, and more objectively. Um, you know, stop talking about what we like because um, that isn't very useful. It's you know, it's not useful to say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I think it's flat out wrong. You, I don't see how you can believe that and still believe that you know, I believe in God, the Father, Almighty, Maker, of Heaven, and Earth. So, you know, I wish I had an answer. I'm kind of new at this, really. I mean, um, I've only been at this artist thing for 10 years or so, so um, I'll probably be at it for a long time, and I. I don't know how much change I'll see in my life. So I think it's worth worth it. Any questions?